So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to this conference. Um, this is the Network Performance Workshop, and my name is Alexander Dyke. I will be acting as the chair for this, uh, for this workshop, as well as pr a presenter. Without further ado, I'm also changing the name for this workshop to some extent, to the Network Performance Deathmatch. <laughs> At this end of the stage, we have myself <laughs> and John Fastabend representing Intel. We have uh, Jesper Dangard Brower representing hey, What's that? As a, as a judge. Yeah, as a sword, yeah. <laughs> as a some semi-neutral party, although he tends to favor, you know, the other side a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have uh, Saeed Mohammed. Uh, oh, actually, I'll just skip. Uh, Tariq Tukan and uh, Anil Ansel, who will be representing the Melanox side of things. Um, for the Intel stuff, we'll be presenting uh, page-based receive paths with page reuse. DMA API to enable better use with build SKB and XDP. Um, zero copy using AF packet to accelerate user space networking. Um, Red Hat will be presenting, or Jesper on behalf of Red Hat will be presenting the kernel memory optimizations. And uh, Amir, Saeed, and Tariq will be presenting RX streaming and bulking, um, TX bulking, bulking and multi-packet TX, multi single TX descriptor transmit. And before this gets into an outright deathmatch, you know, deathmatch is a little bit of an exaggeration. To some extent, within the community, we don't so much compete as, uh, well, it's, well, is it com com well, not quite competition, but it's coopetition. That's the word I'm looking for. So to some extent, what it is, is the rising tide raises all ships. When we implement something in our driver where, okay, we implement this new memory barrier, Look, we get all this extra performance. Odds are, six months later, Mellanox will be implementing the same barrier in their setup. A good analogy for this is, for those that are familiar with the high jump, back in the day, you know, you would be doing this, you know, just a vertical uh, jump over the high bar, and then at some point, somebody came up with the Fosbury flop. You know, it's this weird, funky-looking technique for doing it, but suddenly, you can get an extra couple of feet on your high jump. And lo and behold, a couple years later, everybody's doing it. And so that's kind of the goal of this session is, you know, this is the stuff that we're doing that makes it look really good. This is how you do it. Okay. Yes, it goes both ways. Admittedly, to some extent, I've done the same thing with DPDK. So, you know, you see how somebody does something. It's like, oh, that's a good idea. I think I'll borrow it. So as long as it's not licensed inappropriately. Anyway, so that being said, I'll go ahead and just cut into my bit here, and this is the part where we're, it, I'll be a little bit less exciting. So, basic setup for implementing page-based receive with page reuse. So, I thought I'd bring this up just because, you know, it's come up on the list a few times. So, a basic receive path. You allocate a, usually it's a page. Um, it used to be an SKB for a lot of people, but SKBs include extra overhead. So, we now just allocate the page. We DMA map said page. Assign the page to a device, usually in the, using a mechanism such as a, a, a descriptor, like a received descriptor. And then when you know, the device performs a DMA, notifies us somehow, we unmap the page, assign the page using either build SKB or SKB add RX frag to get it in there, preferably build SKB because the add RX frag leads to a bunch of mem copy stuff. And you return to step one for the next descriptor and so on and so forth. Pretty simple setup, except for it doesn't perform very well because Step one, allocate the page. Well, as uh, yes, we can attest, that's expensive. Step two, map the page. Well, okay, it depends on what you're running. If it's an IOMU, it can be really expensive. And then, you know, assign to the device, okay, that's cheap. Then unmap the page. Oh, yeah, IOMMU, that's expensive too. So by the time you're done, you've taken all these expensive operations to get the receive buffer in, and of course your performance hurts. So what do you do? You do it with page reuse, which uh, some of the older implementations, this is actually kind of a little bit of a mix here, so I'll explain some of it. So steps one, two, and three are essentially the same. You still have to map it, allocate a page, map it, and assign it to the device. After it's written back, though, you can start thinking about your options. In the case of most uh, network traffic, standard Ethernet uses an MTU of 1500. 1500 is not all that big when you compare it to a 4K page. It's actually quite a bit less than half. You actually have enough room there that you can get away with doing things like what we do in the Intel drivers, 
where we just use half the page and then we reuse the other half. And so with that logic in mind, we only need to sync the half the page that we're actually going to use and, well, we can do something with the else with the other half. So we take that other half and, uh, well, we take the half that's been DMA'd into and we have to at, call skb at rxfrag to go ahead and put it in the page. But the problem is, um, with the existing DMA API as of, I think it's what, 4. Dot, I want to say 4.9, 4.10, I can't remember the exact number now. Um, but with the legacy DMA API, you couldn't actually write anything into that page because there were some cases such as software IOTLB where if you were actually using that, it would invalidate the entire region on an unmap. So if you wrote anything in there like new header or something like that, unmapped it before the, the TX or before whatever was supposed to read the packet read it, you could have just corrupted data. You'd have packets going around the network that don't make sense. And so for that reason, it had to be left read only. So you'd end up having to copy, he copy the headers out if you wanted to do something like routing, which copying is expensive. But on the, the, the nice side of it, instead of having to allocate another page, you end up skipping to step 6a here, which says, okay, don't allocate another page, just increment the page count. That's all you need to do. And then we end up having to add a couple steps where step seven, you go ahead and sync the other half page of the page back for the device and you just give it back. And as long as these, whatever you're giving these uh, SK buffs to is freeing them fast enough, you don't have to do any more allocations, any more mappings, any unmappings. All you end up doing is get page and sync just over and over and over again. If it's not doing it fast enough, there is a bit of a penalty there in that you have to fall back to the legacy approach. So at step eight, uh, if it's not returning it fast enough, you have to return to step one. Otherwise, you just get to go to step three. And so it ends up being a net win there. So like I was saying, legacy DMA API um, didn't support DMA attribute, uh, yeah, DMA attribute uh, skip CPU sync on architectures other than I think it was uh, I think there was an ARM architecture that had actually implemented this because for them, mapping and unmapping was just way too expensive. And so they were already doing sync, but they didn't need the map and unmap to do any of that because they just take care of it themselves because they only had wanted to sync part of the buffer. They never wanted the full thing. And I looked at that and it's like, it's an opportunity. So I basically took the attribute and I spread it out over all the architectures. Anything that required a, a cache line to get invalidated or overwrote memory as a result of DMA unmap, um, would end up uh, with this not doing that. So you could call uh, the DMA unmap page, pass DMA attribute skip CPU sync, and it won't invalidate the memory. So now it suddenly becomes possible for us to reuse pages, and we don't have to do the mem copy because the pages are now writable, because us unmapping the page later isn't going to invalidate it. Um, the only real changes needed to the driver are to add this attribute, and then in addition, you have to make sure you perform the synchronization yourself. So basically, when you pass this attribute, you're telling the DMA engine, I'm smart enough to handle the synchronization myself. You don't need to help me. I'll go ahead and do the sync for what I need and only what I need. You don't have to do the whole page. Um, and I've already got implemented code in IGB and IXGBE, and I believe that's in uh, Dave's tree as of now. Um, I have tr code in Jeff Kersher's next queue for I40E and I40E VF. Um, that'll probably be in Dave's tree most likely in a couple months. I don't know, it depends on what the timing of it all does. Um, and that's most of that. Uh, and actually, I'm gonna cut back one thing. So I kind of skipped over step seven. Uh, the one other change I made to the kernel um, that it occurs to me that I didn't bring up in this. So one of the downsides of page reuse is get page itself has a cost. Mind you, it's not as bad as uh, the full page allocation was but it does add up because it's an atomic operation. It ends up being something like, I believe, was it, it's like 10 nanoseconds, something like that. Yeah. Yes, it, something ugly just because, cycles. yeah, because uh, it's an atomic operation and on x86, atomic operations cause pipeline stalls and such just because it has cache, flush cache lines and all that. Or, yeah, anyway. Um, so one of the things I added was this page frag cache drain, which is kind of a mouthful to say. Um, but it's due to some renaming stuff that came from, renaming requests that came from the memory management guys. Basically, the, the concept is um, a page frag cache is basically a page that can have, be broken up into chunks and we're tracking it via the page count. So to drain it means we're wiping out all the references we hold. 
So one of the changes you'll find in like the IGB and IXGB e drivers is we're maintaining a per, in the driver itself, we maintain an extra count per page and we do this bulk update of the count. So we'll do a page ref add and it's usually 65, 535 just to be like safe in case there's some, you know, I think I was storing it in a short. So that's the most I can add. Um, so by doing that, I only have to take that get page hit once every 64K uh, worth of uh, buffers received. And so that's basically gives us another gain of several cycles. It's a micro optimization, but it's just something I wanted to point out. And so a page frag cache drain is how you free a page that has multiple references against it in one shot. And the last thing I wanted to say is I just want to make sure everyone's aware because you know, we still see this stuff popping up. Use memory barriers responsibly. By this, I mean don't go overboard and use a barrier that's way stronger than you need. Um, back in the day, a lot of us driver writers, driver writers were using like WMB and RMB everywhere. And that's because that was the only barrier we had that we knew would be there even if SMP was turned off. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the device was writing to this memory, so okay, we don't want to race against it. And so, like, I believe it was, what, two years ago? Um, I worked on coming up with, at the time I think I'd called it coherent RMB, and Linus told me I don't know how to name things. So yeah, there's not to Steven, I'm lousy at naming. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, so the, the big issue was these memory barriers were way stronger than they needed to be. On x86, for instance, um, they equated to an instruction called a, a, uh, like an L fence, or a, I think it was an S fence, and it would just outright cause pipeline stalls, all sorts of performance hits. And technically, if you read the documentation for most things, it's only needed if you're going to be you know, transitioning between MMIO and coherent memory. So if you go to write a device tail, for instance, then you need this barrier to, so you can say, okay, write my data to my memory ring and notify the device. In that situation, yes, you need a barrier. But if it's, okay, I'm checking this bit on my descriptor ring and I need a barrier before I go and access the rest of the data in the descriptor ring, for example, a status bit that says, yes, the device has, or the, yeah, the device has handed the memory back to me, then you only need this DMA RMB. Um, a lot of that, just because like in the case of XA6, the ordering is it's strong enough ordered that you don't actually need a memory barrier. You just need something that says don't reorder instructions past this point is basically all it comes down to. And so that was the main re motivation behind the DMA WMB RMB. Um, the main reason I wanted to bring it up, I thought everybody had already updated and then, you know, we still have issues coming up here and there. So just something I wanted to point out. So odds are there's, you know, any new driver writer out, writer out there is going to find like E1000 or E1000E or whatever and copy it. And it's like, I don't know if that one's even been fully updated for everything or not. So it's just something to be aware of. And with that, I think I'm done. So uh, I believe you're up next. Uh, yes, Burr. Okay. <clears throat> we'll just change the slides, I guess. Yeah, slide deck two, please. Yep. I think we, we can, maybe I should oh, here. control yeah, the slides. Yeah, give you that. Yeah, I keep the mic, you uh, go. I'll try this one. <coughs> yeah, it worked. Yeah, so, so what, what we're seeing is that the fun thing of networking provoking bottlenecks in the memory allocator. So, and as Alex has already talked talk about how, how we try to avoid calling the memory allocator. But for, for allocate, allocating our SKB data structure, we, we, we do need it. and. I would say it's basically done because we have to, I implemented the bug APIs. So now the more fun stuff, I'm playing with the page allocator. And what we're seeing is that it's currently limiting our, our new cool feature, XDP. So basically the baseline performance of, of the page allocator, we, we, we really cannot use. And, and we're using tricks like, like page recycling as, as as Alex just talked about, and I'm wondering, can we generalize this and can we integrate some of these ideas in, into the real page allocator or the caching layer in the page allocator? So I'm playing around with different things. So you can, I think I have a graph here where, where you can see what, what the cost is if we go for, for different order pages. So normally network people don't know what order means in network pages. I also have a small uh, order to size conversion. So order, order zero means four kilobyte and order one is eight kilobyte, and order two is 16 kilobytes, and so forth. So we, some, some drivers allocate larger order pages, but basically if you look at the order zero pages, it is much faster in the graph, 
And the, the reason for this is that uh, the, the page allocator implements uh, a, 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 ca a caching facility for, uh, for the zero pages and not for higher order pages. And <clears throat> so, and the yellow line shows one of the tricks that some of the drivers do to avoid some of these uh, uh, mapping overhead for, because what you could do, as Alex says, he is splitting up the page in several smaller fragments. So what you could do, you can allocate a, a much larger page, like 32 kilobytes or something, uh, or the tree page, and then split that up. And, and you can sort of amortize the, the cost there. As, as, and, and I think, believe the trick is also on some architectures, it's very expensive to do the DMA mapping, so you also have right. yeah, to do that this. Right, yeah, you yeah. Yeah, you avoid the DMA mapping costs because you only do DMA mapping per page. So that's sort of interesting. The, 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 the green line there is our 10 gig uh, line rate budget, which is like 200 cycles. When we're playing with stuff like XDP, we, we really cannot use the page allocator directly. We really need some recycle facility because we cannot have that the, the page allocator is taking up all our budget. And th this is actually the improved graph because before the, the base of the page allocator was, was over, over, over the green line, but we, we recently optimized the page allocator to, to actually get below the 200 cycles cost. Um, I, I actually basically already covered this slide, basically. Uh, so we, we, all, we, we, we allocate larger order pages and we hand out this fragment. But in reality, we, 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 it's, it's sort of problematic and Eric uh, hits us in the head every time because what you, what you can do, like number two, you can have a, a clever pin down of memory, uh, which is something that Google sees that you can, when you have this larger order page, you hand out, outrun, you have an out all the fragments you can only free the page when all the fragments have been returned to you. So a, a, a clever attacker can, can cause pin, downing, pin down of, of, of these 32 kilobytes by making sure that, that you are, like your TCP stack, stack uh, needs to hold on to, to some fragments of the page. And generally, when you call the memory allocator directly for allocating these large order pages, you're not sure you, actually, you can actually get one. And you can also get issues with the memory allocator all of a sudden going into reclaim or compaction uh, and, and can, can stall for a period of time, which is something you definitely do not want at these speeds. And it, it does not scale well at, at computer mode to, 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 put, uh, to, uh, to allocate something higher than order zero pages because it, there's a central log in the, in the page allocator that, that everybody has to grab. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, all the, all, basically all the high-speed drivers, they, they have to do page recycling because the allocator is too slow and avoiding the main mapping. So the thing is, I, I want to generalize this, and I think I proposed something. I think this is the next slide. Uh, so, because I, I feel that every driver is reinventing the, the, the page recycling mechanism, so. Wow, well, no, see, that's the thing. If nothing else, Eric's copying the Intel approach, apparently, so. Yeah. We just need to standardize that, formalize it into an API of some sort. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's basically the, the deal. Either, either I implement some kind of page pool recycling, which I obviously think is, is better, but I also we, we generalize Alex's approach uh, more so, so it gets easier to use for, for the drivers of, of, of this yeah. kind of uh, uh, page recycling. So we can avoid the, 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 the DMA uh, map and upmap. The drivers still have to handle the DMA sync part, and yeah, let's 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 see how far I, I get and how when Alex gets gets annoyed enough to generalize the, <laughs> the concept. Yeah, so that's the thing. Is you, do we just need to do rock paper scissors up here on stage right now? Yeah, decide who's stuck <laughs> actually doing it. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think that's that's sort of what 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 I had, and and this is a real API I implemented. So. <laughs> Keep out free seven slides. I don't know if we need to discuss more about fighting over the, the page allocator. Well, it's just a matter of, you know, if nothing else, you know, all of us are fixed in time, and so it's just a matter of one of us having enough time to work on all that, so. Yeah. Yeah, if somebody else out here wants to take it on, you know, I'm willing to help review patches, but. Yeah. Only so many man hours I can put out as this individual, and I have to work on uh, checking and see what, seeing what resources I have to put towards that effort, so. Yeah. 
but there's, there's definitely some interesting work going on in this area, yeah. and 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 we 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 are, we are we are seeing progress. I think we can change to the next slide. Yeah, um, be I, ha I have a question. Um, do we do we know like today what is the limit of the page allocator? Because lately we've been hitting like this 80 or 70 gig uh, barrier because of the page allocator. Can you speak? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, lately, we've been been hitting this uh, 70, uh, 70 gig barrier um, with our performance testing, and uh, with with, with your latest optimizations that is still work in progress. Um, we we get to the what we need to the line rate of 100 gig, and do we have any plans for future work for like uh, preparation for 200 gig, etc.? Yeah, we we have. So the preparation is that uh, we, we, we do some, some faster page recycling, but I'm generally also optimizing the page allocator. So we, we started like it cost like 270 cycles or something. Now, now we are down at it costs 100 and something, 180 cycles or something. And, and, and we, we, we can, bring, we can bring, it, bring, it, bring it further down. I, I estimate I did some really, really crude hacks of cutting out a lot of the stuff in the page allocator for the, for the but all the zero cache it has in the page allocator, and I estimate we can get as low as 100 cycles uh, for, for actually accessing the page allocator. Uh, so and, and that's, I, I think I'm going to hit some limits around 100 cycles for, for, for getting pages out of, of, of the page allocator. Which is, it should be less than 200 gig. Yeah, yeah and, and my budget for so we still need 200 like cycles, right? Yeah, we, we, we still need some, some kind of Recycle yeah. caching because we we don't we cannot get lower than 100 cycles. That's my yeah. prediction. Okay. Actually, probably before we go to John's thing, um, any questions in the audience about either my presentation or uh, Jesper's? Here. So my question is about the uh, new implementation of the page pool. Uh, so the page cache or the page pool, is it bound to a specific uh, uh, receive queue? Is it bound to a specific net device? It's, it's, it's bound it's to a specific, specific receive queue. Some of, I get some of the performance out of that that I bound, I'm, bounding, I'm creating a page pool per, per receive queue, actually. Because per receive queue? Yeah. Okay. And that's, uh, that's, that's my RFC patches that is out there. Yeah, and see, that's the thing. I think that's... We may want to re-examine that. It may be better to do it either per node or per CPU, depending on which way you want to look at it. Because yeah, the per queue can end up being, there's a reason why I'm hard capped at such a low, little value, and that's partly because like, the implementation in the Intel drivers is all per ring, because we just basically fill the descriptor ring, and as long as the pages stay there, they stay there. When you start looking at a pool, doing it per queue, that becomes something yeah, that can suck up a lot of memory. Cache, but the pool is uh, bound to a, a I'm, I'm device. Still go, I'm still going. All right, yeah. it needs to be bound to the device, but yeah. I'm saying it doesn't need to be you know, per device per queue. It could be per device per CPU or per device per NUMA node. Yeah, okay. The per CPU becomes yeah. an easier way to deal with it. Yeah, but, but it's a given that the device would allocate only one, one queue per CPU, so, so you will get that. Well, one or more queues per I'm, CPU. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm betting on that. That, that, that so I'm sort of protected while, while the, the NAPI, so. Well, right, but see, that's also why I'm thinking per CPU, because then you're still protected by NAPI, and if you're not running on certain CPUs, you just don't have a page pool there or whatever. So you could, in theory, double up your page pool than if you like, have the queues stacked on a, a small set of CPUs. Yeah. I'm, just I'm, a thought. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm still going to, to, to bound how much we can have in the page pool to make sure that we don't, like, can run, make the system run out, run out of memory. I'm right. going to be use a bounded bounded page pool uh, to avoid this thing. But but what what's what's likely going to happen is well, one of the tricks is that you you run dry and well what happens you have to actually ha ha call the normal page allocator. So in that situation, I want to implement uh, bulking f from the page allocator. So we have this bulk API of allocating from the page allocator when we, when we hit the right. situations where we run dry. That's yeah. why I'm, I'm not afraid of making a fairly small bounded uh, queue because I'm right. just going to get bulk from, from the page allocator. And when returning, we, I'm also going to do a bulk API for the page allocators. Then we can discuss if it's bounded, if we, we, we encapsulate it in something called page pool or we encapsulate it in something else that right. Alex used, or yeah. we open code and use these bulk uh, API calls directly in the drivers. That's 
that's completely up to how yeah. we use these APIs. Yeah. And time will tell. Any other questions? Any more questions to me or else we can hand it over to John? Okay, yep. Okay, hello. Um, I was going to talk about some. One more qu quick question. Oh, good. Go ahead. May I, uh, so, just making sure the, the page pools are not by themselves trying to solve the, the memory fragmentation issue that you mentioned, right? Where a bunch of applications are holding a specific page so you can never release yeah, that. Yeah, it won't solve that. No, it's okay. It's, yeah. no. Because if you, I guess, if you somehow bounded the as, as you mentioned, if you're running dry, if instead of you just stop the receive queue, that would kind of solve it, but maybe it cause a bunch of other problems when you cannot replenish the, the yeah, receive the, queue. So I've, I've, I've talked, to, that's, that's, I think you're sort of hinting to some of the other benefits from, from doing a page pool, because if I'm doing a page pool, I have to account how many outstanding pages I have. Uh, and, and I could use that to say, okay, I want to stop because now I can see the system has used half of the pages in the system, and I'm not going to allow this receive queue to proceed. Uh, that's, that's, that would be one of the sort of the one of the benefits from from using uh, a page pool, but, but but it's sort of a derived uh, uh, benefit. I, I I won't bring into like the discussion why we should do this because it's maybe it's not that useful. Uh, any more questions, or comments? Okay. Um, so I just wanted to talk about some early work uh, Bjorn and myself are doing uh, around AF Packet. Uh, yeah. Okay. Here we go. So if, if you're not familiar with AF Packet, it's kind of what drives behind libpcap and Suricata, and I, I know there's a bunch of other tools. So. Um, it was sort of motivated to accelerate the existing data path for these applications that are running in user space. And one of the, since it's kind of a common theme, it seems that uh, it would be great to remove as much copies as we can. So we saw that earlier today with some of the zero copy stuff for TCP and UDP. Uh, starting from that premise, we have the idea that we would like to also support zero copy Rx in, uh, in these uh, other applications as well. So how are we looking at doing that? Um, first, we have an application that sits at the top there. Uh, it has an AF packet socket that it creates, and it has some memory. Uh, if we can memory map that, uh, that, that block of memory and pen it, um, or alternatively uh, request memory from the kernel itself, we can then pass the, the pages into the driver. And why we want to do this is so that when the driver today, when it does a DMA into the, into the kernel, you're grabbing pages out of a page pool or, or a driver allocated page, uh, and these are all owned by the kernel, which means then you have to, in the traditional AF packet, you have to process that, build an SKB, uh, send it to the AF packet socket logic, and then the AF packet socket, socket logic will do a, most likely a copy into user space. So what we've sort of identified is the cost of all of these things add up, and, and correspondingly your performance per packet goes down. So by pushing the actual pages into the driver, letting the driver populate the descriptors in the driver so that we can do uh, Rx DMA copy into the memory that is shared with user space, uh, we no longer have to build an SKB and, and also do the, uh, the copy in the stack. Um, so uh, that's great. Um, now the, the sort of next question that comes out of that is, so you've initialized the descriptor ring. It has a bunch of DMA addresses that it knows map to an uh, application program. Um, the question is, how does the application then understand that the packets have already been copied into user space? So what we've done is we've built a virtual descriptor ring that is shared between both the application and the driver. And when a driver receives a packet, which it has already DMA into, into memory that the application knows about. It then translates its own descriptor into a common generic uh, virtual descriptor that is shared with the application. And that descriptor is actually defined by 
uh, AF Packet v4. So we did look at using other older versions of AF Packet, uh, AF Packet v2, v3, um, but trying to map a descriptor that is sort of built for hardware and a descriptor that had never been intended to use with hardware is challenging. And because we're trying to get the lowest possible overhead, we want to get sort of the closest mapping as, as possible. Um, the important, or at least one important observation here is that the descriptor that the application is looking at in the virtual descriptor ring is not specific to any hardware. So although we are doing this right now on Intel hardware, um, we um, fully expect and, and we we'll want to review it with other vendors to ensure that we don't somehow encode some sort of Intel specific bit into that descriptor. The idea being that if you have an application that runs on your 10 gig uh, AF packet v4 today, you should very easily be able to swap out a 40 or 100 gig and, and run the same program and see uh, you know, the performance improve. Um, the next question that often comes up in this context is if you, how do you decide what uh, descriptor ring in the hardware to use for, uh, for this? Um, if we just sort of mapped all the DMA uh, addresses on one descriptor to, to user space on an arbitrary ring, uh, you know, RSS would usually kick in and you'd get some flows in user space and some flows in kernel space, so you would be uh, totally unmanageable. So what we're doing is we're using the hardware features uh, that exist on, I think, almost all of the 10 gig NICs, I believe, and, and certainly most of the 40 gig NICs that allow you to use an intuple filter to match a five tuple or uh, IP address or a MAC address even and forward that traffic to a specific queue. And we expect then that since you, when we do the mapping from, uh, of the memory from the application to the driver, we specify the ring to use, then you have a five tuple or some other kind of match that says, I want all of the traffic that has this IP address, for example and I want to forward it to this ring. Uh, it's sort of a two-phase step at the moment, uh, but it seems to work pretty good. And then the rest of your rings can use RSS as normal. Their traffic goes to XDP or the stack or, or wherever they go. Um, I think what we have is fairly generic now. Um, the, we had an uh, original sort of rough patch set that we sent out to the mailing list um, that did a V2 translation, so the idea is very similar. Um, just with the improved uh, data structures and descriptor formats. Um, and well, we hope to get out some patches soon, but they're not out there yet. So that's the Rx path. Um, the next question is, so you've received packets in your application. A lot of applications also like to send the packets. And, and so how do we do the same sort of logic but in the other direction? So because I have the infrastructure to share this virtual ring with the application already, we can do the same thing with TX rings, map them very similarly, similar to how we do it in the RX case, map the virtual ring to a hardware TX ring, and uh, we can have the application populate the virtual descriptor ring and then kick the hardware, at which point the hardware then needs to go and read the ring, uh, set up its own descriptors, and transmit the packet. So uh, right now we, you know, we debate on exactly what this kick looks like. It could be a system call. It could be something like the... Um, always on busy pull logic that we talked about this morning, um, something along those lines to kick it. And, and this is sort of the rough sketch of how we're doing uh, zero copy into user space for RX, TX in a sort of hardware agnostic way um, while trying to limit the overhead that we incur from this. So um, it's a workshop, so I felt okay showing very early uh, patches and, and design. Um, but I think, you know, next NetDev, we should have some performance numbers and hopefully share. Uh, maybe the, the interesting thing is if anybody is working on similar stuff, it would be great to hear from you. Um, if anybody has any comments or, or questions, um, you can ask now or, or definitely come find me later. It looks like there's some in the back. Yeah. So. The mic? Does anybody know where the other mic is? It's right there. Yeah, it was behind your laptop. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So hopefully that was somewhat clear. <laughs> A lot of details. Um, about yeah. the uh, virtual, this is very nice, by the way. The uh, virtual descriptive format, Yeah. Uh, is Vertigo suitable for this? 
Sorry, what was the I missed is, is Vertigo a suitable virtual descriptor ring for AF back at V4? I still missed the part of it. The yeah, question, the question oh. is, is Vertigo a suitable descriptor ring uh, format for Vertigo? Yes. Uh, um, we did look at Vertigo, and it's really close, but there are some issues mapping the Vertigo descriptor ring to the hardware. Um, we have some hope that the Vertigo next, they're working on a new spec for Vertigo. Maybe the next spec might be a little bit closer. Um, it's unclear, so we went off and created our own AF packet before at this point. Yeah, so uh, we looked at this problem a lot. Um, 0.95 vert IO, 1.0 IO, uh, vert IO, they both have the same problem, multiple in this direction, not suitable for DMA. Um, if vert IO is going to go in a direction where it is suitable for DMA, it would work out. But for now, there is a whole lot of uh, optimization that is missing when it comes to hardware. Okay, so I'm not involved in Vertigo, but I think that there are plans to have a Vertigo 1.1, so it may make sense to try to at least um, work towards a common solution here. So about the RX strings, I think Tushar was also saying the same thing, and he, I haven't talked to you, but if you have any patches, you know, if you want to share them to us, with us, we'll give it a try. But for the TX side, um, I know you're trying to save um, a copy and all, but if, would it mean losing checksum offloads and things like that? Uh, yeah, in the existing prototypes that we have, we have ignored the hardware offload uh, piece of it. Um, That's kind of not nice. I mean, SKBs, I get cursed out a lot, but <laughs> being able to offload some of these things really helps, so it would be nice to keep that. Yeah, so checksum is, is a good one to, to consider. Um, I, I think we are also uh, wrestling with that in the XDP world as well, so maybe we can come up with some solutions. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think it's a valid point. <clears throat> Have you left space in the descriptor rings for other use cases? For example, being able to push UDP and TCP packets that have been received on the device to user space? So, I, I mean, if you're asking if like some packet is received on another descriptor that's not doing the direct kind of mapping of DMA addresses, could you also push it to? to well, I'm, I, I'm thinking zero copy receive of TCP packets. Zero copy receive a TCP packet. So, that, so if, there, if a packet is on the ring, at the moment we, any packet that's received on that ring that has been allocated to the user space is, is zero copy to user space. And so there's no way to like somehow get that back in the stack at that point. Uh, it, it, it's more you need to leave space in the descriptor rings to identify the socket that it came in on. So, so the question is, is the, the descriptor format at least extensible to a degree? Um, the current prototype descriptor format, I think, could probably use some, uh, a, perhaps additional review to see if additional use cases will work in there. Um, I am, I'm definitely interested in any feedback on that, on that front when we actually get this on the mailing list. I'd be really interested to see. The sort of other point I would make is though we are trying to go for sort of op maximum performance here. And so if it slows it down, then we have to weigh the flexibility versus the cost. And um, my opinion is it's not terribly expensive. Um, you can mix and max, match AF packet v4 with v3, for example. Right? It, it pushes the complexity into the application, though, which is, again, perhaps not nice. So. Yeah, but that, that complexity is worth, worth it for things like messaging systems where you have lots and lots of packets coming right. in and, and doing a lot of fan out. Well, then so. you're also talking about an environment where you have to have shared memory between the applications then, right? Which is easily attainable in a lot of these dedicated yeah. use cases. So. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, I think yeah. it's all okay. valid. Uh, more questions, please? Okay, the back, you've had your share for the day. So I have a question, actually. Sure, right? Jamal. So I think I asked you this before. R you can do better than RSS. I can do better than RSS? Yeah, I mean, RS uh, you can... Well, you can RSS is the default. Yeah. That's all he's saying is that something's distributing the queues. But if I just if I wanted to do TC, what do I want to do that's better than RSS? Oh, I, I just let's say I just want to look at DNS packets. That's the only thing I want to pass to user space. Yep. So user space packets are in our model are you steer them 
via the usually flow director or TC or something, right? Um, right. What I'm saying is that the rest of the queues can still use RSS in parallel. Right, so you, but you probably don't want to pass all of your traffic to user space. This no, I, 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 very okay, good. so I just want to pass specific flows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. doable, not RSS. Yeah, but give, not. give us a couple months, we'll have something. Right. You can have it and RSS. Yeah, pretty sure we can do that. Uh, I've got one question over here. Uh, sure. It's regarding the scatter gather interface. Do you support that? Like, um, it, it might depend upon vendor to vendor how they're uh, basically. Uh, I mean, how many fragments are part of basically uh, that descriptor, right? So it could be, say, 16 could be more, depending on window what you're, um, I mean, um, targeting, right? So uh, how would you generalize that particular space within the descriptor of, say, for example, a TX? So it could be number three bits, which you might be in the actual descriptor. It could be any number of bits, right? So it needs to be generalized to have some sort of a very virtualized solution. Um, I think I missed the question. Well, so, so basically, there's a way to, to handle scatter gather, right? You have some sort of end of frame notification or something like that. So is, is this a single buffer only setup, or is this something where you could assemble a scatter gather list and handle like jumbo frames? Um, maybe we could handle jumbo frames, yes. Again, the, the prototype is not so concerned with this. Yeah, because if nothing else, it's probably like a one bit field that you'd have to add to your descriptor to say, like end of packet. End of, I mean, just like the hardware does, you could have right. the next four descriptors or actual virtual descriptors belong to the same packet and then set the end of packet bit. Yeah, right. seems reasonable. Yeah. Um, there's, there's always a, 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 you know, I think we need to get the, A, the prototype done, get some original code out there, get the code completed, and then I think these to me are sort of features that fall, fall into a kind of subsequent patch set. Thanks. Yep. Sure. Yeah, so just making sure I understand. So with this approach, the, the packet gets into application memory and it's kind of completely lost. Mm -hmm. yep. There's no... Yeah, it shouldn't ever see, really see the stack, if I understand it right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is the point. Um, yeah, the, 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 the point is that this, you, you pointed it, you have to have a hardware filter that puts it in, into a specific queue. And you have to, in this specific queue, to, uh, to solve the early DMARCs problem, you have to have pre-mapped the memory in this queue. And this, this memory that is pre-mapped into this queue is also mapped into user space. So that's the only way user space can, 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 can do zero copy receive. <coughs> and, and it's completely bypasses of the kernel. It, does, it, it, it cannot, it just plays. The only thing that happens in the driver is that it puts it into it also does the descriptor translation and, yeah, does the and tr ensures that the thing. memory is secure. Yeah, and, and the, the only thing the driver does is flips a bit that says now this belongs to user space, and well, the user space well, flips. Well, more bit. than that, you, yeah. have, you have to actually write the virtual descriptors right because we don't want to end up in a scenario where um, every time I upgrade my hardware, my my application breaks. Yeah. Right. right. So, uh, and again, I think we should have a conversation because. In we are building a new descriptor, so why not? Okay. We could yeah. share, maybe. Sure. Yeah, Alexei. Can we get the mic? <laughs> Can we get the microphone over for to Alexei? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Last one there. Yeah, last one. Alexei, too? Okay. Last, last one. Uh, Roni asked first, I think. So, oh. so uh, I just want to uh, comment on the Vertaio and whatever the future Vertaio descriptor will be invented, 1.1, uh, 1.2, 1 and 1.2.2. I would say even if it fits the purpose, if it will fit, it should not be used. The reason is that Vertio is a spec with its own lifetime, with its own <coughs> multiple organizations dealing with it. This is pure kernel networking. Yeah, and <coughs> sorry. And I think here we should not be like dictated by the standards and the specs and the organization and steering committees. It's the kernel should be doing what makes sense from performance point of view. That's it. Uh, hi. Um, I think we also already have this kind of interface. Uh, we use it in the InfiniBand. It's called verbs. So it's the same idea. So you have this kind of generic descriptors that 
you want to go this way or? No, not really. I think. Uh, <laughs> I'm suggesting. It's a good suggestion. Because um, we because we did it. We already uh, struggles on to this, to have um, a generic descriptor, mapping the memory, all those kind of stuff. Uh, a r way to create rules. What ring? What we just do is creating the ring in the user space. So I think give this give the same uh, same value. I, I think you should be like at least looking at the RDMA stuff and the verb stuff to like see what what kind of mistakes did they they do and right. and oops, let's try to avoid those but take the good things. So I I also, I also think that it looks like a lot like RDMA. You 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 map the the user space memory in to a Q pair in. Oh well, yeah, that's essentially. So it's essentially yeah, it's very similar. The kernel yeah. sees all, so yeah. you cannot. Another thing, uh, are you considering what these, those packets are bypassing the kernel, so TCP dump and all those kind of stuff, or any filters will, bi will be bypassed? Yeah, it probably should be the case, I would think. So you're, you're asking yeah, about if you have a socket filter running on your AF packet that you, yep. that you used to have? Well, um, presumably, then you should be, if you wanted to port that application, you should be able to run that filter in the hardware. Right, because we're using the hardware as the as the pre-filter into the into the socket at this point. Right. Yeah, I, I'm asking it because we have some customers that's asking, okay, if, if you're using verbs when you're doing TCP dump, I want to see those packets. So there. Are so you can set up your hardware to mirror it to another queue if you if you think that's valuable. Okay. Yeah. Is that going to walk out of the box? I don't because see why it would lock out of the box. It just starts mirroring, or well, yeah, no, you just break out TC and you say, okay. Okay. I, in, instead of rewriting the traffic, just mirror it to that other queue, you know? Yeah, makes sense. Maybe we should, should move on to, to the yep. middle locks people so that they actually yep. get some time to talk. Well, I don't this, think... This death match or well, actually, I think the clock started at, what, 55? Yeah, I think this is not a fair death match. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I think you guys are getting some more time here. That, that I, think. I think we are up to the task. So, yeah, just yeah. add 15 <laughs> minutes onto the... Or add, a, what, half hour onto the clock? So you guys still have 45 minutes, yeah. that's what well, we promised you. Yeah. So it's fair, you know, yeah. it's fair. It we it's 45 we'll minutes time. for us, 45 minutes for you. <laughs> we'll take our time. No, we're ready. Yeah, we just need the slides. Everybody's Should be sitting. the last set. We're ready. Yeah. There we go. The coffee is ready outside. There you go. Thanks. Um, okay, so I'll be talking about, like, um, some bulking mechanism we've been working on. Um, in both the device driver and uh, our hardware. Um, I'll be presenting uh, the R RX bulking in the device driver level, which is made for like, a, more for XDP purposes with the, with the huge um, XDP programs that does intermixed decisions. Um, then we'll we will move on to RX byte streaming, which is striding RQ, what we have in our hardware. Um, after that, we will move to a different topic, which is also bulking, but for TX uh, and uh, TX doorbell batching and device driver and TX bulking, uh, descriptor bulking, which is the multi-packet uh, descriptor uh, in, in the hardware level. <coughs> um, so why RX bulking? Why do we need this? Um, Today, as um, Alex showed, we have a lot of steps we do for every, every packet inside the hardware. And uh, uh, we, we, every packet we get from the hardware, and we do lots of steps. And last thing we do, we pass to the stack. And we would like to patch those steps into, um, into some stages and uh, move data into uh, a, a pipeline in the RX path, and at, at the end, pass multiple packets to the stack, um, which uh, should do the work for our um, uh, use case when XDP is um, loaded. So uh, the stages we are going to do, um, like first thing we will need to uh, data and uh, Rx descriptor early prefetch um, so we can reduce uh, cache misses which is today what, is, what, what hurts the driver m the most is the first data cache miss we hit on every packet. Um, 
another motiv motivation is that we also utilize the instruction cache, as I said, uh, for large XDP programs. Um, it seems theoretically, because this is still under uh, development, uh, but theoretically when you have a large XDP program that, for example, drops uh, every second packet and passes every first packet, um, this way, the, the code of the uh, receive path will move back and forth between the kernel and the XDP code. And, 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 and the, the, the point is that, that it, we, uh, we, we have to reload the instruction cache for the, e yeah, for, yeah. For, for the EBPF program that's run as, as Yeah, as so, XDP, so the, the, XDP the idea is to bulk the XDP program to run on... We, we know that the XDP program is going to drop, like, um, specific amount of packets. We will drop them, then we'll go handle the other uh, packets that are going uh, into the stack. Um, so this is a motivation. Um, today, as uh, we already said, this is what we have in, a, in, a, in, in a, an API loop. We do uh, some pre some um, fetching of the uh, Rx descriptor and uh, uh, completion in, in case of our hardware. We fetch the data, uh, sync the uh, DMA, run XDP program, um, build an SKB and populate the SKB fi fi fields and then pass to the stack, um, which is goes flat today uh, and we would like to do some bulking. Um, uh, and the problem that we have, as I explained, um, that we always hit a cache miss at the beginning of the fetching of the descriptor itself and the, the data pointers that the, this descriptor points to. Um, again, also instruction cache invalidation um, when we have uh, like uh, large XDP programs. Um, so the idea is to break um, the Rx path into like those, um, in general, those three steps that uh, we have in experimental code right now. Um, we fetch uh, in, a, in a loop like we, we fetch a predetermined uh, amount of packets or descriptors into some temporary uh, array in the Rx path. Um, uh, then prefetch the data itself, um, DMA sync, and, um, and feed this temporary um, completion element into the next stages, which is the XTP program, first of all, store the decision. Then run the decision, like first of all, we do XTP drop and XTP TX, which is uh, still uh, inside the driver code, which is small uh, relative to the XTP code and the kernel code. And then uh, take all those SKBs that we lift with and pass them to the stack. Um, um, yeah, this is the idea. Um, so there are, uh, as I said, this is like uh, still in progress, uh, and there are some risks, and um, it, it's been also uh, uh, a very problematic implementation uh, that I've been experiencing because uh, every change to the code, like today we have um, those uh, known steps that you need to do, and once you start breaking them, you start hitting new cache misses, and you go back to data that you already prefetched, and you start experiencing new cache misses that you need um, to handle by fine-tuning fine the code. Um, one more thing that uh, the prefetch is, w without the XDP program, this big XDP program, we don't uh, experience a, a very huge, or a, we, we only experience a little gain uh, in the data path. So uh, without XDP, we wouldn't feel, uh, theoretically, we wouldn't feel any uh, improvement. Um, it, that, that's, that's because XDP, we touched the first cache line uh, much earlier than... than yeah, earlier. right. So we, uh, we need to like uh, test this code and see how, 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 how it is how it is how, how it it works in the uh, common case and the XDP case and most of the cases that we need. so and there are some questions to be uh, to be raised like how many prefetch do we need because the prefetch is uh, like cache line dependent and architecture dependent so we need to do in, to, to know in advance and to have some numbers um, also for the common stack do we need um, 
to like have different Rx paths for the stack uh, delivery and w when you load XDP program, uh, have the staging uh, running and when you don't have XDP program, run the, uh, the flat uh, Rx path. Um, Anyway, uh, those are questions to be raised, and this is a work in progress, so we are going to do a lot of testing, a lot of measurements, uh, and many architectures, and many kinds and types of workloads. Yeah, uh, I think it will be like a test-driven development to yeah, make sure that we yeah. don't introduce any regressions, right? So this is the idea, this is the plan, this is what we are going to do, and see w w where it goes. Um, I want to share some um, early results that we have with the, w w with the, the current uh, XDP benchmarks. And w without, w w with my early patches, I, I, I w and with some fine tunings, tuning to the driver to, to, to solve the cache misses that I introduced with the RX, RX batching, um, we see the a 10 percent improvement for the PTX with the data touch uh, because the prefetching uh, works slightly better than the before and one to two percent for XDP drop and stack delivery because the XDP program is so small that you cannot just you can't see the improvement um, uh, so that's it for now uh, as I said, this is work in progress. Uh, I think in next net we will have some re results and some uh, wide measurements and more performance numbers. Um, so, any questions? Okay, I'll pass to Tariq here. He's uh, the main implementer of the hardware lever RX bulking. Thank you. <coughs> so, um, I will talk about uh, the RX bulking capability we have uh, in our hardware. Uh, the feature name is Striding RQ. So uh, first I will start with the uh, disadvantages of using the conventional RX ring. Uh, this is our motivation. So in the conventional RX ring, uh, each uh, each uh, hardware per packet, we have a hardware descriptor. Uh, and for each uh, hardware, des hardware descriptor, we, um, we, we do two uh, PCI transactions. Uh, one to read the descriptor, and the other to, uh, to write the, the packet uh, to, to, to its place in the, in the memory. Uh, another thing is that uh, we, we should be ready to, uh, to receive uh, packets of any size. So the buffer size should be the largest possible, uh, which is MTU. Um, and, and this is uh, very wasteful uh, when the actual occupying packets are very small. So uh, the memory model of the conventional arcs uh, uh, ring uh, is like this. Uh, we have the, the buffers, and let's say that uh, small packets are flying in. Um, each packet goes into the, its buffer. You can see, for example, that uh, uh, we use, out of, uh, out of the large MTU uh, allocated uh, memory, we use only small small amount. And all the rest is uh, just wasted. Um, and, uh, and that is, uh, we, want to, we want to avoid that. So uh, starting RQ is, uh, we, we call it a byte stream buffering. Uh, and uh, in starting RQ, we do batch for the hardware descriptors. Um, we call every, uh, every entry uh, multi-packet Wookie, uh, Wookie for uh, work queue element. So every element uh, can serve uh, multiple packets. Um, and uh, each, uh, each buffer uh, can serve, uh, we, we allocate buffers of larger sizes, uh, not MTU, but much, much larger. Uh, typically it's uh, about uh, uh, 256 kilobytes per descriptor. 
the buffers themselves consist of order zero pages, so uh, we are fine with, uh, uh, with the disadvantages of using high order pages that uh, Jesper uh, to just talked about. Um, and uh, the hardware knows to write the received packets continuously. So, uh, uh, of course, with, uh, with, uh, with some alignment, because we a bit care about performance. But <laughs> and uh, let's say uh, uh, a stream of uh, small packets uh, are flying in. So they, they will, uh, they, the, both the small packets will go into the same uh, buffer, one after the other. And uh, the whole uh, buffer is still available for upcoming uh, packets. Uh, so uh, this way we uh, we save memory, uh, which means uh, for the same bandwidth we ask uh, for uh, for less pages for, uh, from the page allocator. Uh, so actually, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, is there no padding at all being added on these, or are you doing some sort of padding to at least align things? Uh, we we do align, but uh, not uh, we don't. don't uh, uh, I, will, I will talk about this next. We okay. don't do about control over that. So yeah. it's a hardware alignment. Okay, it's just hardware alignment. Yeah. You mean the padding of so the packets? Yeah. Or? yeah, I'm just, you know, they're, they're, he's talking about it writes from one to the next. It's like, okay, it's, well, there's got to be some padding there. Otherwise. No, th there is have, alignment. Yeah, there are. Right. We have okay. strides. Yeah, we can, it works we can, like with strides, not bugs. Yep. So right. We define the stride size and uh, okay. the hardware writes into stride. Typically, okay. we have the stride size that says 64 bytes, and uh, the, okay. the packet will consume a number of cache right. lines. Right, so the packet consumes a number of strides. Right. Yeah. Yes, and the next okay. packet will and start the, with the next right. cache line. Next so we yep. okay. won't have misalignment. OK, so among the advantages is that uh, uh, we, uh, per each uh, the, the, the transaction, the, the PCI transaction to read the RX descriptor is now done uh, only once per uh, a, a large multi packet wiki and not per packet. Uh, we, uh, we, we waste much less memory. Uh, the DMA writes uh, are, uh, uh, we get higher locality in the DMA writes. Uh, and uh, we, we are not directly affected by the MTU size. So uh, another thing is that uh, we, we see that uh, uh, in, in hardware we, we have a higher, uh, higher limit for, uh, for Q for the packet rate. We have uh, a, for a single ring uh, 50 million packet per second, while we had uh, 30 million with uh, the other uh, type of RQ. Uh, uh, we still uh, we still have issues when when it, uh, when it comes to fitting this with uh, XDP. Uh, we this does not fit with the requirements of page uh, per packet or uh, linear SKB because here we use uh, non-linear SKBs. So that we will take this as future work. Um, we are also uh, considering uh, a few enhancements uh, in, in hardware. For example, uh, um, currently we have a, uh, a packet uh, might, uh, might cross uh, the, page, the page boundary. So we would like to avoid that so, and then keep uh, each packet, uh, uh, each SKB for a packet with a, um, with uh, with uh, my one uh, one fragment, um, and also uh, later we would like to move to uh, linear SKB, so uh, we'll add uh, uh, hardware capability to, to to reserve some room for uh, head and tail, so we could use the build SKB uh, over the received packet. Uh, Performance, uh, we have performance numbers. Uh, of course, we have uh, uh, with our single uh, TCP stream, we, we saw uh, uh, a, a, good, uh, a good gain. Uh, with the multi stream, we, we were hitting a line rate and we still hit line rate. So, uh, also, um, the packet rate is, uh, is higher and we're, we're still optimizing this. 
Um, another uh, measure we did was uh, sending uh, uh, bursts of uh, small packets. And uh, because we are, our, uh, our buffers are byte stream, uh, they, they, they can handle uh, more packets without, uh, without dropping. Uh, so the uh, conventional RQ, uh, you could see uh, uh, drops starting from uh, even for a burst of 2K packets. I'm talking about small packets. Okay. Uh, but there was starting RQ even for 32 kilo packets. Yeah, we, we see no drops, only starting from 64. Yeah, that's, uh, <clears throat> I want to comment on that. That's, that's just, just because you now, now you, you sort of compress the packet, so, so you, you, can, you can handle a um, lot more. Like don't waste for, for, the, for the same <laughs> amount of memory, let's say. Yeah, <laughs> bef 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 before you map out the rings, you have the, the, a thousand uh, uh, entries in your ring queue. <coughs> right. And only a thousand packets can and, be there. And only a thousand packets can be there. But, but now, because you actually only use the space you really need, you can actually handle a lot of more small packets. So you can fit a lot, lot more than a thousand small packets in, 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 in this, this type of queue. Which is, oh, yeah. which is really nice. nice yeah. That and you're seeing a, probably a much more efficient PCI set, because I imagine you guys are probably writing the 64-byte <coughs> packets probably like four or five, or no, was it eight at a time? Since if you're doing a streaming DMA, it's like, okay, four packets in a single 256-byte uh, write on the PCI bus is um, going to be much more efficient than doing four single 64-byte or 60-byte copies. So, yeah. yeah, that's also, I'm also seeing, I'm hitting limits on the PCI. Us. Yeah. So, so that this will basically also help a lot on the PCI because you limit the load on that. Well, as far as so I have a mic. Is there a mic? I'll ask my own that's the one yeah. in front of. <laughs> so, so how does the DMA unmapping work for your um, buffers? Uh, I'm Jesse oh, Brandberg, okay. by the way, from Intel. Only after the uh, the whole uh, buffer. Uh, is consumed, we do uh, the, the unmap uh, all at once. Yeah, they have a bug. I informed them of it a while ago. No, no, it's, uh, the bug is not related to the striding RQ. It's for XDP case, which is the regular RQ. Oh, OK. Yeah, so in, in striding RQ, we have like only eight descriptors, each pointing to um, 256 uh, kilobytes. Actually, yeah, they're having to do the copy. Yeah. That's right. They are all mapped when, once you allocate this descriptor and unmap once you consume all of this descriptor. Right. Yeah. But, but I, I think that that's so they do the same thing as regular page reuse because they can't actually use it with build SKB or anything like that because uh, they don't have any headroom or any of that or tail room. Yeah. So yeah. they're just doing the same thing we were doing in the recycling. So they would copy out the header and then just append it as a read only page. Once that descriptor is fully consumed, we can just unmap it. Uh, right. we, we use like reference counts for, for that, like the one uh, Alex talked about. So once the ref count yeah. hits back to, um, it's, it's consumed, we, we, we unmap the page or the pages. Wait, you don't even have and to worry the about the ref count. The I, I think, I think what, what yes, yes, Wait, you can just unmap a regular page yeah, that, the DMA that you're using. Sync is what I'm talking about. The DMA sync on the sync for CPU. Yeah, Does it work yeah. on those really small sizes or whatever, right? I think I think I think Jesse's case is a uh, point is that 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 the page has to be considered read only. I, I think yeah. You, yeah. So yeah. so what what they do they allocate a separate area, copy all the headers, and do all the setup, right? right. And, and and put put the the, the the page data which is considered read only down in the right. And then in, as long as the, uh, the, the page count is greater than the, one, it's frac, considered read only. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so they can unmap it safely while they're still holding at least one reference. Yeah. It'll be more critical because the, the, on, on your slides you mentioned that uh, you wanted to use build SKP. That's not you cannot do that right now. Uh, Which is the future improvement. That, yeah. that's, that's a future improvement you have to do, and, and then you have to make sure you use uh, Alex's uh, DMA sync APIs. Right. Well, yeah, that's if right. you get, if you get to the point where you can get build SKB. I'm guessing that's going to be a little while yet because you have yeah. to add the headroom and tailroom. So yeah, yeah, I, I think you're, you're still missing some hardware changes, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I just want to mention that uh, the. Uh, Hyper-V receive area is pretty much the same way with our Endis. We have a big, it's bigger, it's just one big chunk of memory stuff gets plopped in there. And yep. right now we have to copy it out. We've, there's been some experimental patches to do copyless receive, but we have the same issues and the same issues with supporting XDP, where we'd have a shared area where we want right. to give you some, here's some, here's a packet, run your program, but by the way, 
you know, it's not, you don't really own the whole page, you own right. that part of the packet. Yep. Uh, and if we want XDP to be general, it's got to do that. It can't, we got to lift some of those restrictions. Well, see, that's the thing is right now, one of the big things with XDP is it's the fact that you can go in and actually modify aspects of it, and that's one of the main uses. Well, the, for the it, thing so. is, you can let people modify as long as you're willing to say you can mod either you say there's, if, you're mod if you, if you want to shoot yourself in the foot, you can, or if you say if you could give some range restrictions. Um, well, that's, so like, um, other than, so there was the DMA API issue, which we've, if you yeah. use the correct attribute now, that's not a problem. So was there something else within Hyper-V that was uh, making it so that you couldn't uh, change the region once it's been given to the uh, driver? No, there's not, I mean, you can't, you'd have to go give another region, but that's another, you don't want to okay. do that. It's expensive. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if anything else we can talk about it offline. Oh, yeah. Just another question about the striding. Don't you have like a massive true size slash um, memory, pinning, memory pinning problem? They, they chunk it up. That's if I'm not mistaken, right? So yeah, it's the same kind of thing we do with like, so right now, if you take a look at the SK buff allocator, it ends up using a 32K chunk and it only says, okay, I only used, you know, X number of cache lines, so I'm gonna report that in terms of my size for true size. Right, that's kind of fine, right? But if you have like this big page and you, you're pinning one TCP segment in there, you're still pinning like this whole memory. Yeah. Yeah, but still, uh, we, it has use, the same we use order zero pages. So uh, uh, like, yeah, yeah. All, all, yeah. all the other Maybe pages are released. So. Down to, yeah. Okay. I guess, I, yeah, I, I still think like you're cheating a little bit on the true size, but. Uh, well, everyone does. So. Everyone does. And Eric gets upset with us every time. Uh, Eric does it. He's good in the SCAPI allocator. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, so. Okay. So, uh, that was the uh, starting RQ. Next, uh, I will talk about uh, an uh, TX bulking idea. Um, uh, the idea to be implemented in, in software this time. Uh, uh, it was actually <coughs> it was actually discussed uh, recently in a in a uh, in a mail thread in the mailing list. Uh, so uh, let's start with the motiv motivation. Uh, in um, the uh, packet stream, you uh, uh, you should notify the hardware whenever you have uh, new packets ready for transmission. Uh, these uh, notify hardware operations uh, called doorbells uh, are costly. Uh, they, they include uh, barriers, they include PCI operation. So we, we would like to uh, save uh, as much doorbells as we can. Uh, and uh, we would like to do it uh, uh, once per a batch of these packets and uh, not for every uh, single packet. Uh, there is an existing uh, solution uh, uh, it's called Smith Moore. It's a uh, Boolean field in the SKB, uh, and it indicates where uh, uh, if another packet is to follow, and this way the driver knows uh, to not issue a doorbell, but wait for the next packet. Uh, well, uh, we, we we took this uh, took this idea, and uh, we want to uh, do a transparent. Uh, Smith more uh, like mechanism and driver level. Uh, we would like to save the doorbell if we know that that the snappy completion uh, is, is expected soon. Uh, and when, uh, when the nappy context uh, 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 runs, uh, only then we issue a single doorbell for all the packets accumulated in the ring. Uh, well, uh, uh, I think um, uh, Eric raised this uh, uh, idea in the, the mailing list, and uh, he also implemented a patch for uh, Melanox 4 driver. Uh, he, he also saw uh, a gain of about 75%, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, so I took, uh, I took this and uh, wrote a patch for uh, Melanox 5, over Connectix 5. And uh, 
and uh, we see uh, uh, as a proof of concept, we see uh, the, the gain we can uh, we can get uh, in packet rate. Uh, uh, still, we have uh, uh, many serious challenges. Uh, first, uh, it's about synchronization. Uh, who should uh, uh, ring the doorbell? We should synchronize between the uh, NDO context, the NDO start XMIT, and the NAPI context. Uh, maybe do a hardware level tick spoiling. Uh, another uh, challenge is uh, that the, uh, the waiting delays are now variable and might be less uh, less expected. Um, solutions might be adaptive interrupt moderation in TX uh, or uh, TX busy polling that uh, uh, Eric uh, uh, talked about uh, earlier today. Uh, but uh, we, we are. Uh, this is uh, still uh, under uh, investment you know, uh, investigation. So, uh, uh, that's it for uh, the TX uh, bulking in uh, in driver uh, level. Uh, next, uh, Amir will talk about uh, bulking in hardware level. Okay, that's the green one. Yes. Okay. Maybe maybe some people have some questions about the. Yeah. the uh, sure, if you have questions. Because it's, I, it's it's a little bit controversial because we, we can introduce added latency, right, in, on the transmit. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, we, uh, uh, added latency, but uh, you get uh, more packet rate, so you know. It's, yeah. uh, well, yeah, that's the thing. That was yeah, this is, uh, Honestly, yeah. I, I kind of that, submitted something similar a few years back, and so, yeah, that was the number one argument, is if you're adding extra latency, it's going to be the fact that basically you're not transmitting anything from the time you submit that first packet until you re-enable the queue to resume transmit again. And so, ideally, if there is a way for us to identify windows where we start to exceed, I think, if, if nothing else, you may want to look at, instead of trying to find a way to just automatically do on the first packet, somehow track the flow itself. Say, okay, the flow now is going to switch to bulking instead of automatically just, you know, first packet comes in and okay, we're setting the uh, yeah, that, that, stop and. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's the, uh, the moderation we were trying to I, I think to we do. have to play yeah, a lot we thought about uh, to figure uh, out. Yeah. Just, just takes in drop moderation where it's you. Exactly uh, like RX latency. Well, oh, right. That's the thing. It's basically we're introducing RX latency on top of the TX latency. So yeah. But anyway, yeah. We don't have a ton of time, so let's go ahead and. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, that can be solved in the TX moderation, where you can adaptively understand where you are in the. Right. Uh, from the completion, if you, uh, if you, if you, uh, you start in a low latency mode, and then if you see that you can, you aggregated many packets right. to be sent, then you can increase the TX moderation. Yes. Right. And then uh, avoid it. Okay, um, so uh, TX bulking or uh, multi-packet uh, TX descriptor. Um, so on top, this is, this is uh, comes um, in, in cases uh, where you already have burst of uh, packets. Uh, uh, Tariq's work was uh, to enforce the, these bursts. Uh, and this uh, feature is uh, when you already have burst of, of packets, either uh, with uh, XMIT more enabled or any or with uh, this method. Um, so that's uh, that's where it comes to uh, to optimize. Uh, today uh, there is the transmit uh, wookie that takes the scripter uh, is um, 64 bytes. So you have uh, each 64 bytes. Um, has a control, header, Ethernet header, the pointer, and it has a padding because it must be 64 bytes. So if you have three cache lines, you can only use those three cache lines to uh, post three packets. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you took 192 bytes and post uh, three packets. This is what uh, you have uh, today until, uh, this is, uh, until ConnectX 5. Uh, in ConnectX uh, 5, we introduce uh, a new feature called multi-packet multi uh, wookie, or this, this descriptor. Um, in this feature, uh, we don't need, uh, we, we can aggregate or we can hang more packets on the same uh, uh, transmit descriptor. Uh, um, it can be up to 
60 packets if you increase the descriptor large enough to be uh, 1K, which is the maximum. Um, so th there can be no, um, th th there is no obligation to have shared header between those packets. It can be different MAC address, different TCP, different uh, pointers um, at all in the memory. Um, so um, you can just uh, uh, it's put the, the pointers into the text descriptor and notify the hardware and it will uh, transmit it. Um, again, all, the only difference in, uh, um, in the way that the text descriptor is formatted is just the opcode and, uh, and then the, the, the NIC knows how to handle these uh, pointers. And uh, the, so what are the benefits? Uh, the benefits is higher packet rate because you get a better CPU utilization. Uh, you are handling the same number of uh, cache lines in the software, but uh, sending more packets on the same uh, cache lines. So cache misses are, are, are less, and that causes higher packet rate. Um, Second thing is better PCI utilization. If you have 64 bytes to send and you have, you have 64 bytes to, of control uh, to be sent over the PCI, that's only 50% of the PCI that's being utilized. And if you want to get to full 100 gigabit uh, line weight, you can't utilize only 50% of the PCI. You need to have as much as possible utilization. Uh, so in this case, you can uh, you can uh, utilize much better. And uh, the third thing is you can use uh, this either the same number of uh, entries in the transmit queue and have a lot more outstanding packets, or you can uh, use smaller queues which have better memory cons consumption and still have the same amount of uh, outstanding packets. It's just a format here. So it's the same format as the regular one, just a different uh, opcode. And this is an example of the same three cache lines uh, uh, we saw before. But this time, uh, the same three cache lines uh, can contain 10 packets. So the average uh, overhead per packet, instead of 64 byte, goes down to uh, 19 bytes in 10 packets. And if you go all the way, you can uh, get up to 17 bytes. Uh, per packet if you do uh, 60 uh, packets per burst. And of course that depends in the length of the burst that uh, the software is uh, pushing. Here's an example for uh, what you can do with the transmit queue size. Um, so for, for the uh, uh, default mode, you have 1,000 entries that takes up uh, 64K bytes, and you have a uh, maximum of, of uh, 1K outstanding packets. Uh, with the new, uh, new uh, format, you can, you can reduce the size to even a quarter of that and, uh, s s and use quarter of the memory and still have the maximum of outstanding uh, packets uh, with the same number of uh, the same ring size. Uh, so that's the feature. Any questions? We're not going to allow questions. If you, uh, uh, quick one. So to repeat the question, what about offloads? Because the transmit the transmit descriptor doesn't contain any info at that point. For a TCP offload, uh, you need to use the regular one. But it, that's already optimized because you have only, uh, that's already actually using some kind of multi packet descriptor. Can I? Can if I it's TCP of, if it's this segmentation discussion, of Let's have this discussion the whole way. Right. There's some barbarians finishing the coffee and all the, everything out there. This was for 30 minutes now they've been just consuming that. So. Yeah. And since we're late, uh, have this discussion after. Yep. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to cut it short. Yeah. <laughs>